thank you. Amen. It is a joy to be here. It really is. Uh, I'm so grateful to God. I told the Lord a year and a half ago, I'll tell you the date. It was, well, it was about April 24th or 25th when I woke up from an unexpected medical intervention. I had an aortic dissection. I just thank God. I don't know what I had. Thank God that I woke up, I was alive. I said, Lord, you spared my life for some reason. Amen. And so uh, whenever I get the invitation, I'm blessed to present. I, you know, rearrange things. And uh, it's a beautiful town. Uh, I'd love to come up in summer, though, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank uh, Pastor Guerrero. And uh, I was blessed by the Bacchuses and uh, the music. Uh, just inspiring to me. And Amen. I even took a video so I could take it back to my church. Amen. Let the folk know that youth ministry, child ministry has begun. Amen. Now they used to say uh, they're the, the church of tomorrow, no, they're ch the church of what's happening now. Amen. 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 And then I thank uh, Pastor D for that Christ centered message. Amen. Uh, it's been said so many times. I love the quote of all professing Christians. Seventh day Adventist should be foremost in lifting the cross of Christ. Amen. Amen. And Lord, help us to do that in everything that we do. I uh, have just a few introductory remarks, and then I'm going to get to the PowerPoint. Um, it's on. Okay. Uh, this is uh, 175 years since 1844. I think we need to say that. 175 years. Not out of pride, Pastor. I know, and some people say it with pride. But, <laughs> but 175 years. So you know the Lord has like been ready to do something. And in fact, in my discussion with uh, Pastor D, we were talking about how the Lord had already tried once. The parallel is to Kadesh Barnea. Uh, Numbers chapter 14, when Israel came to Kadesh Barnea, they were ready. They could have crossed over, but they made the mistake of uh, putting it to a vote. And one thing it showed is that as much as I love and respect church governance, that the majority is not always right. The question in any and every situation is, what does God say? Amen. Is there any word from the Lord in every situation? Amen. Uh, and so we're still here. But I pray not for long. Amen. Because my heart is really yearning for the coming of the Lord as I gray and, and get older and so forth. Um, so what I want to, let me just say what I want to try to do today is help you encourage you to see, many of you have seen this, Christ in all the gospel, and in particular in all the Bible, but in particular in the festivals of Israel. And the reason for this is that, as we all know, we believe that the understanding of Christ's ministry in the sanctuary is the foundation of the Adventist faith. And in particular, the understanding of the 2200 day prophecy that leads to, points to the antitypical day of atonement. So that's a lot of stuff to unpack. What it says is that there's a type of the day of atonement and then there's an antitype. And if that's true of the day of atonement, it's true of all of the seven festivals. We see it very clearly in Passover, don't we? Okay, Israel came out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Christ was crucified. That was the fulfillment of Passover. But that did not exhaust all of the symbolism and the power and the principle of Passover, which is why you read Revelation 15 and uh, John sees this group of people standing on the sea of glass. They're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb because they recognize they have come out of the world by the blood of the Lamb. So, I just want to whet your appetites. Now, uh, I need to say this also. Uh, even before I pray, I'm saying all this. 
There has been, in some quarters, a uh, there's been dialogue, maybe even debates, about the feasts, the festivals, the moeds, the moedim, whatever you want to call them, the appointed times of the Lord. And they're actually of the Lord, they're of Yahweh or Jehovah. They're not Israel's appointed times, because that's how God speaks of them. These are my appointed times, that's what he says. And in our church, in our, I won't even say in our church, in our denomination, there's one church, true believers are everywhere, in our movement, I'll put it that way, there's been a debate and it usually centers on this question, and it shows how if you don't ask the right question, sometimes you can create more heat than light. It's usually on the question of, should we keep the festivals? That's not what I want to deal with at all. What I want to deal with is the question of, why did God give the festivals what do they reveal about the gospel of Christ? And do they perhaps, perhaps even reveal something about the process of our Christian experience? Those are the questions I want to deal with. And then once we wrestle with those, we don't have much time to do so, um, we leave it to every man, woman, or child's conscience in terms of how, what they will do with it. Okay. So having said that, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, our elder brother, the one who denied himself, came into this world, was made, born of a woman, lived holy and righteously, and laid down his life. We're so glad, Father. We're so grateful. And yet, Lord, we ask you to help this deep truth to sink even deeper in our hearts. Today, Father, <clears throat> help us to look at the feasts, the festivals, and to glean what we can of a uh, richer understanding of the symbolism, of the theological significance, and of the personal significance for our Christian lives, our Christian walk. Bless us, Lord, guide us, and grant us your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to begin in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Most of you know it by heart. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the, good, the glad tidings, the good news of Jesus Christ. And in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, he elaborates on that, that Christ died according to his gospel, that he was resurrected. But even before we talk about his dying, we talk about his incarnation, that he was not, and he became certain things. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, fallen humanity. That's important because the Bible tells us he was made like his brethren, Amen. not like his brother. Amen. If it were just Adam, we would say he was made like his brother, but he's made like his brethren for the purpose of condemning sin in the flesh, of taking this fallen equipment in humanity and saying that sin would not reign, and not only would not reign, but would not even be able to have any way with him, although he becomes the sin bearer. So we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans. Paul goes into a deep discussion about faith. Romans 5 uh, verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith. And let's just say a quick thing about justification. <sighs> that in some circles seems radical, but it makes perfect good sense if you think biblically. When Christ lived and died, was crucified, all of humanity was justified in him. Amen. That bothers some people. Because, they, because in their minds, they say, 
Does that mean that everybody's going to be saved? No, but I tell you what it does mean. It does mean everybody has been saved from something. Mm -hmm. From that premature death they would have experienced in Adam because of Adam. Amen. Because when Adam sinned, at that moment, what he deserved was extermination, annihilation, to be no more. But because Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the grace of God unto salvation was manifested in their experience. We see right there in Genesis the uh, skins evidently that there was a death that took place pointing to Christ. And so Ellen White writes about this so clearly in, in Design uh, uh, Steps to Christ. And uh, the point she makes is that the life that we have now, this probationary life, this opportunity to accept or resist the gospel has been purchased by the death of Christ. And so it's important that we understand that because instead of our saying to people, come to God, he's going to do something for you, the good news is that God has done something for you. He has redeemed you. Amen. The question is, will you accept this or are you going to remain a prodigal child? So this justification that Paul talks about, in Romans 5.5, 5, it comes closer. By faith, by believing this good news, we experience justification by faith, which is the transforming justification of being born again. Paul describes it here, therefore being Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can testify. I'm going to interject some testimonies in, my, in what I share today. When I came to the Lord um, in 19, first in 19, about 1979, I became a Baptist. I'd grown up Catholic. And I come to the point where I didn't have much, I didn't have faith in God because human beings were eclipsing God. You know, just like the, the moon covering up the sun in an eclipse. The Church of Rome, in my mind, and, and being led to people. And I just said, well, if that's what it's about, you know, I'm just going to be out here. But when I came, became a Christian and came to know Christ as a Baptist, it began a movement toward greater light. Amen. And the first thing I experienced was peace. Before that, I didn't have peace. I was a troubled brother. I'm going to tell you the truth. I was a very troubled guy. I was, I was at a, a good school. I was at Harvard. I was, uh, went on to Columbia Law School. But I had trouble in my heart, in my soul, you know? Very troubled person uh, with, with a lot of bad habits I'm not going to go into because the children are here today. But when I came to Christ, I had peace. And I'm going to tell you, we, we don't really understand how much people need peace. How, I mean, how troubled people are, or the pain of peace. I mean, my goodness, I've dealt with... Um, so many people taking their lives during my, my time in ministry. And I realized, uh, as Pastor was saying earlier, we, not, not, we need to be vulnerable and we need to be there for people. This is the best way to show the gospel of Christ. But let me go on, Romans 5.1. So I want to jump to Romans 5.5. 5. After talking about the process that happens after we believe by faith and we experience justification, we're born again, we get a new heart, the Spirit of God, Romans 5, 5 says, it says, uh, here we are, and hope does not make us ashamed because the love of God, the agape of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. That's everything right there. That's everything. And that's what the beginning of, of, of uh, salvation is about. God coming to dwell in us as we abide in him. So now we're going to look at how the gospel is revealed in the festivals. And I want to use a quote from uh, Daniel. Daniel said, I think it's uh, Daniel 11, I think it's 42b. I may have the wrong number, but I'd like to take a moment to look. He says, the people that know their God will be strong and do exploits. And the reason is because the whole world order is going to be turned upside down 
by this movement of God. What, what, what Ezekiel uh, was told will happen. I will overturn, overturn, overturn until he comes whose it is. What Daniel described, the storm cut out without hands, crashed into the empires of the world. All of these things will happen under this movement, under the outpouring of the, 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 uh, the latter rain. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 18. Um, I saw an angel come down for, from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. As pastor taught this morning, I couldn't help but think about, you know, it was just so great he led us to Gethsemane because there we saw Christ wrestling with the same things that his people will be wrestling with and God will do the same thing for us that he did for Christ. He will send down that help from heaven. Amen. That fourth angel. Amen. And you notice that that angel came to Christ after he prayed three times. After we preached the three angels messages, that fourth angel will come down and the earth will be lightened with his glory. And that the earth will be lightened with his glory through his people. A people who finally are growing and have grown to the full stature of Christ. And if you follow Revelation chapter 14, we always talk about the three angels' messages, the first three angels. And of course, the fourth angel of that series, because the series of seventh angels, is actually over in Revelation 18. But then after those angels, there are three angels that remain. We call them the angels of the harvest. And so when we preach the three angels' messages and teach it, we need to be thinking about the harvest. But what the harvest means for our personal experience is growing to maturity, to the full stature of Christ, because you harvest a crop that has grown to a certain point, right? Okay, and that's what the people, that's what we need to do. Uh, and, and that's what God will do in us, because we can't do it ourselves. But he provides the means for our spiritual growth. We're born again of incorruptible seed, and this seed he will grow to maturity. Okay, now I want to mention uh, just a couple of people who grew to maturity. Moses and Paul. What do I mean by that? I keep, I keep going back to your message, teacher. <laughs> Christ endured the cross for the joy that was before him. The joy that was before him was seeing, as the preacher said, our faces in glory. That is spiritual maturity to the exponential level. But Moses and Paul developed a mature Christianity also. You remember when uh, God's people, Israel, built the golden calf. And uh, the Lord was going to just get rid of the nation, right? Because these people just won't behave, you know. And was going to make of Moses a new nation. But Moses prayed, he said, Lord, blot my name out of the book. You know, if you can't save these people, then just blot my name out. Because he was concerned about the glory of God. Paul writes something similar. He says, I could wish that I were accursed for Israel's sake. Because here's this nation that God has brought out. He's been leading, been delivering them from captivities. And he's had all these great promises of the covenant about them. And here they've rejected the Messiah. And Paul is saying he could wish that he were cut off from God just that Israel might be saved. That's mature Christianity. I've been guilty of it. And I know we've all heard folk come to prayer meeting. And uh, any prayer requests. Uh, but me and my family, you know, <laughs> which is good. We ought to pray for our family. We ought to pray for my family. Pray for my health and these other things. But God wants to move us to a place we have a, a more of a holy boldness and really recognize what he can do and where we really are empathizing with our great high priest. We're standing with him as he intercedes not just for the church but for the world. John chapter 4, he's called the Savior of the world. And that's where God wants to lead us. 
so that we could say, Lord, I could wish I were a curse if you could just save Chicago. Amen. <laughs> okay, let's go. We're limited in time, so uh, let's go. The everlasting gospel and the seven festivals. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Beautiful thing about this movement, after being Catholic and a Baptist, and I learned a little bit about how to holy dance in the Pentecostal church. I never could speak in tongues. <laughs> but after all that, when I became Adventist, the sanctuary, God's way is in the sanctuary. Suddenly everything came together. The sanctuary is God's show and tell. A child can understand it. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nothing reveals his means of giving us righteousness as well as the sanctuary. The cross is representative of the altar of burnt offering. The altar of burnt offering in, in the, the model of the heavenly sanctuary represents the outer court, represents the earth where Christ was crucified. To be the Savior, Christ had to assume the nature, the human nature that he was redeeming. Yes. This is what's so powerful. He was not these things, but there's a word, a four-letter word. He was made certain things. You know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He was made to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I think Galatians 3.13 says he was made to be a curse for us. He was not a curse, but he bore our sins and became a curse that he could bear our sins and annihilate them by his righteousness, by his holiness. And we could go on. Uh, Paul in Hebrews chapter 2, turn there with me. I love the Apostle Paul, man, the way that guy writes. See, I majored in uh, philosophy when I was in college. Just about drove me crazy. <laughs> it really did, I'm serious. But <laughs> in Hebrews chapter 2, let's go there. And I know you're all familiar with it, but I, I just want to read it because he, he's so emphatic. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. He was not, but he was made a little lower than the angels for a specific purpose, for the suffering of death, crowned and now crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Talk about that second death. He tasted and, and he experienced what uh, the preacher described this morning, that separation from God by faith. He had to trust that he was going to come through that, but he experienced what it would be like. And in verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bring many sons to glory and unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified, that's us, are all of one. We come from one source. We're born again of incorruptible seed. He's the everlasting father to us, for which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Man, isn't that something? I know how folks are sometimes. Sometimes we have a, a brother or a sister or cousin maybe who did something they shouldn't have done and they end up doing a little time and sometimes we act like we don't, but I don't really know them, you know. <laughs> kind of ashamed. You know? But here we are, we're all guilty. But Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. It's the goodness of God. This is what leads us to repentance, the goodness of God. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us, he, Christ, also, in the same way, himself, the same Christ, likewise, in the same way, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Notice how emphatic the Apostle Paul is being here in verse 14. I took, uh, in, in high school, I took a course, uh, public drama or 
public speaking and drama with a teacher whose name was Marvin Jesus Hercules Nova. <laughs> and he would just constantly correct us about how to speak. And if, if Paul were to say this in class, Mr. Nova would have said, Paul, you're being redundant and tautological. And Paul would say, I intend to be because I want to be emphatic. And that's what he's doing. Christ also himself likewise took part of the same of what we are, that he might deliver us. And then finally, verse 17, this whole chapter, Paul's repeating it over and over. Verse 17, wherefore, well, I should go back to 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. The drama of salvation takes place in the seed from the beginning. Which is why the festivals are also important, because the festivals happen at harvest time. At the harvest time for barley, the harvest time for wheat, the harvest time for fruit, for the fe Feast of Ingathering or, or, or Tabernacles and so forth. And so God was teaching a lesson. He's teaching something through the feast, the festivals. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. By his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought by sin. Amen. You know, you feel like, man, that would be enough. It was Satan's purpose to bring about eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Amen. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to us, to humanity, by a tie that is never to be broken. Amen. <clears throat> this message. Righteousness by faith. And we all know this quote, Testimonies of Ministers, page 91. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Jones and Wagner. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the cross, the sacrifice for the sins of the world, the cross. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. I like that last part. Because sometimes people have a knee-jerk reaction to righteousness by faith if they've been kind of deep into legalism or they've been in the fall. And they say, well, all this righteousness by faith, all that's fine, but what about obedience? What about, there it is. Righteousness by faith produces obedience mm -hmm. because it is through a faith that works by love, by agape. Romans 5, 5. The agape of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. That's from Testimonies to Ministers. Many had lost sight of Jesus. How did they do that? They did it by debating by what you were talking about this morning. I guess it's good I followed you. <laughs> right? They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person. His merits, not by works of righteousness that we have done, right? His merits and his divine love to the human family. Jesus, lover of my soul. All power is given into his hands that he might dispense rich gifts unto men. As Paul said, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God wants us to know that, to believe that, to stand on that imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. Without him, we can do nothing. Christ put himself in that position, not using his divinity, so that he could say, the works that I do, Christ says, the Father that dwells in me does the work. Mm -hmm. And that should be our life experience. Whatever we're doing, that it is Christ who is doing it in us. And this is what bothered me. I should say, I became an Adventist in 1981. The day I was baptized, I got some books on Jones and Wagner. And this quote always bothered me. 
This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. And some say, well, how is that the third angel's message? And the third angel says, if any man worship the beast in his image or receive his mark in his forehead and his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So the third angel's message threatens the wrath of God. But the righteousness of Christ is the protection from the wrath of God. It's the, I don't want to say the escape, but it's, it, it, it's what neutralizes and, and, and delivers us from that. And so we need to focus on the righteousness of Christ. Christ our righteousness. If through the grace of Christ his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. And God will give additional wine. And here are the, the two brethren, E.J. Wagner, A.T. Jones. Wagner was a physician, Jones a military man, and in a sense, when you read their writing, they kind of, in my view, minister to both sides of the brain. One very analytical, and, and the very analytical one is A.T. Jones, it's essentially because he's not the doctor. And then the other one is more graphic and uh, more... Uh, the illustri uh, illustrative and the way he presents it is Wagner. And these two men, Ellen White said so much about the work that they had done. Now, there were challenges toward the end of their careers. I'm not going to go into that today. If I get to come back sometime, we can go to more in depth. But to me, to criticize some of the things that happened to them at the end of their, year, at, of their lives would be like criticizing a cardiologist, a cardiac surgeon who had done 2,000 great surgeries and then for some reason on the, the last surgery, maybe for some reason nobody knows why, you know, he, he didn't get enough sleep and he went in there and just bungled the surgery. Because by and large the testimony of the Spirit of Prophecy on these men was that they had a message from God and Ellen White even said that even if they had lost their way, it would not mean they did not have a message. So, just a couple of books by them. Jeremiah 23, 6, The Lord, Our Righteousness. In every page, whether history or precept or prophecy, the Old Testament scriptures are irradiated with the glory of the Son of God. So far as it was a divine institution, the entire system of Judaism was a compacted prophecy of the gospel. To Christ give all the prophets witness. And this includes... The festival. In every sacrifice, Christ's death was shown. In every cloud of incense, his righteousness ascended. By every jubilee trumpet, his name sounded. In the awful mystery of the Holy of Holies, his glory dwelt. The sacrifice of Christ is the atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. Yes, sir. This is God's strategic plan. The righteousness of Christ is revealed in the festival. Now, I know strategic plans uh, have became very popular. They're, they're kind of falling away from being as popular. But I would always tell people when the church wanted to do strategic plan, the conference wanted to do strategic plan, I said, if the principles of strategic plans are principles of truth, I said, we ought to find the strategic plan in the Bible that God has used. And this is the strategic plan. In Genesis chapter 15, God has an encounter with, I should say, Abraham has an encounter with God. You remember he fell off asleep and was in vision. And he saw, after cutting these animals and separating them so the covenant could be made, it was not Abram or Abraham that walked through the animals. It was a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that represent the Father and the Son. The, the everlasting covenant 
was made between them. To us it came as a promise. It comes as a promise to us. Paul talks about it in Galatians. And it was simply, it's exactly what Pastor D spoke about this morning again. That the God here would be separated, the Father and Son would be separated if Christ did not carry out the plan. And Genesis 15 is important also because there Passover is foreshadowed. Abraham's told that his people will sojourn in a strange land for 400 years and then God would judge that nation and bring them out. Passover is also, and Passover is the first of the festivals by the way, I think all of us know that. Passover is also foreshadowed in Genesis when uh, Abraham goes up about to worship on Mount Moriah. He tells those that are with him and his son, you stay here, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. And there we, there we see a humbling insight as to what worship is. Worship is to yield our everything to God. When he went to worship, he was, he was offering his son, who represented everything that God had promised, back to God. This is worship. It's not just the praise, the verbal praise. It's not just the praise, not just the singing. Those things are important. But the test of the heart is, are we bringing everything? Have we brought ourselves as a living sacrifice? And of course, God provides. And the idea that God provides, he provided the lamb, is telling us about he provides the righteousness that's the basis of our salvation and the basis of the sanctuary service and the basis of all of the feasts. Leviticus 23, the important chapter, Leviticus 23, uh, Exodus 34, uh, two important chapters where we look at the festivals of the feasts. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts or festivals are appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations or assemblies. These are my feasts. And of course, the first one that God mentions is the Sabbath. That's the first one. That is one of his feasts, literally speaking. It's one of his appointed times because that's the term we're looking at uh, not feast in the sense we usually think of like, oh, a nice time with a lot of food and so forth, although nothing wrong with having a lot of food on Sabbath, amen? <laughs> so, I'm going I'm to be skipping over some things for uh, time's sake. So, part of what we learn as we look at the festivals is that God has taken the initiative. God told Israel for the pilgrimage festivals, there are three, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And God commanded that all the men would come to Jerusalem, which meant that their families came also. And the Lord said they should not come empty-handed. In other words, don't come and pass the, the, the tray. Come with something, with an offering for the Lord. And the way that God orchestrated the calendar was that the time of these three pilgrimage festivals were the times of harvest. Passover was the time of the barley harvest. Pentecost was the time of the wheat harvest. And tabernacles was the time of the fruit harvest. And so commerce was moving. People had funds. They had offerings. And so God took the initiative. He provided the means for them to worship him the way uh, that, that, he, that he commanded them. Okay, we go back to the seed of the woman. This is where the drama takes place. With the seed. The Lord said, well, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, speaking to Satan. It's God's initiative. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. While we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Justification, sanctification, and glorification are accomplished in the incarnation, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, despondent soul, take courage. Even though you have done wickedly, 
Do not think that perhaps God, that perhaps God will pardon your transgressions and permit you to come into his presence. God has made the first advance, even though we are the ones who offended. While you were in rebellion against him, he went forth to seek you. Praise God. <laughs> I take that person. God came looking for me. Thank you. Amen. In the parable of the lost sheep, Christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after God, but through God seeking after us. Amen. We do not repent in order that God may love us, but he reveals to us his love in order that we may repent. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Some about love and will break, break down your heart, break down that resistance unless you're just, uh, you know, intransigent, just not going to move. Okay, the Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. He desires his chosen people to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. Else he would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand. And the reason I showed the high priest there, because I love this verse. Whenever I go into a new church, always the first sermon I preach is based on uh, Romans, not Romans, Revelation. I forget the verse now. One, I think it's four or five. But it says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us kings and queens, if I may say that, and priests. That's, you know, that's what he has made us. And yet we find it so hard to really embrace that and believe that. And say, okay, Lord, if you made that, then prepare me, then use me, then equip me. But that's what he's done. So the sanctuary, the path to the throne of God. I put that up there at Sarah Peck. Uh, most of you have seen it. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Uh, I find some of the best books on the sanctuary are written by women. And I think it has something to do, because I notice at home, I let things get out of order. Kind of messy here and there. My wife's always like, she'll come in like, that doesn't belong there, you know? And, you know. <coughs> okay, I hope that wasn't a sexist comment, but that's true. <laughs> the best books are written by. <laughs> okay, there we have, Sol there we have uh, Solomon's Temple and the Tabernacle during the time of Moses. Okay, the good news is his yoke is easy. It's the way of the transgressor that is hard. If we will enter into his rest, which is what the Sabbath represents, remember, when Adam and Eve were created, their first full day was Sabbath. Their first full day was Sabbath. Right. They were made the sixth day. And so they entered into all that God had prepared for them, all this beautiful creation. The principle is the same in salvation. We enter into the work of redemption, the work of salvation that Christ has prepared for us. And then he will sustain us. Amen. He upholds all things by the power of his word. We know he can keep us. Unto him that will able to keep you from falling. Okay, I'm, you know, time is, I'm have to skip over some things. I do apologize. I'm going to skip kind of the seed principle. Uh, I mentioned this, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. For we are saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves is the gift of God. And I like it because the faith he gives us is the faith of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. There's no recall on the faith of Jesus. <laughs> you know how to, yeah, they're always recalling things back in his, yeah, but no, it works. For we are, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Praise God. The new NIV says, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay. Type and antitype. Important principle to think about. We think about the feasts, the Passover, and the coming out of Egypt is the coming out of the world when the new when a believer uh, accepts Christ and is born again. Or the ultimate coming out of this world, which is going to happen at the second coming of Christ. So there's a parallel between the Exodus and the Advent movement. Good book, if you don't have it, Taylor Bunch. Okay, I hear a lot of people, oh yeah, all right. <laughs> Creation and salvation are one. Same power, 
That's what I mean. Not the same power is used. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes in verse 6, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay, so the object lesson of 400 years of bondage, when Christ came, remember, he went down into Egypt, didn't he? That the scripture might be fulfilled, out of Egypt have I called my son. And uh, at the Exodus, when, when God gave the, the Ten Commandments, they were known before, but when in a formal way he presented them to Israel, we should always remember the first part of the Ten Commandments, the first part of Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In the Hebrew, surely is implied there, you will not have, you will have no other gods before me. It's, it's a motivation of gratitude, the reason for keeping the law, the love. God has been so good to me. Man, how could I, you know, preamble. Exactly. So Passover and unleavened bread go together. And of course, Passover, the focus there was on the blood of the lamb. And that same night, uh, the unleavened bread was prepared because they were getting ready to make a hasty exit out of Egypt. So these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. The 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And then the next day, the feast of unleavened bread begins. And of course, Christ fulfilled each of these festivals. And the important thing is for us to see the significance. Passover. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed. And this illustrates Israel coming through the Red Sea. Paul compares it to a baptism, in which case it's the largest baptism that we ever heard of. It's the beginning. It's their uh, anointing, if you will, as a holy nation. It's the birth of a nation. And they entered into, it's interesting, they entered into the school of the wilderness because God had to further educate and uh, prepare them for their mission, which was to take the gospel to the world. For the believer, we must identify with the cross of Christ. Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. So, the scattering and the gathering. Um, this is a principle we can, gra we can grasp kind of quickly here. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were put out of the garden. And this begins the dispersion of people throughout the earth. You know, there's the flood, the Tower of Babel, and then there's another dispersion. The gospel is gathering people to the cross of Christ, to Christ, to the cross of Christ. I should say, through the cross of Christ. Christ who said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. So Paul writes that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The way I think of this, and there may be other ways to think of it, Christ is the operating system of humanity. Any computer geeks? I say that respectfully in the house because I'm not. But I know this, you know, when, when um, with your computer, if you put in a new application, the computer has to recognize it. And you put in a new application, it becomes a part of that system. Everything that system does, you know, when you shut it down, it gets shut down. If it crashes, it crashes. The scripture tells us Paul on Mars Hill, in him we live and move and have our being. If he's the operating system of humanity, then when he went to the cross and laid down his life, it was, I like to think of it as a restart for all humanity. Amen. 
But the question is, who is really going to believe it and accept it and allow him to do to work out that salvation in us? But he's done it. And that's why every time somebody comes to accept the Lord, he doesn't have to go back to the cross. Because he's already borne our sins, carried our iniquities. <clears throat> okay, Paul praying a deep prayer. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. As we spend a thoughtful hour each day, we need to spend some time also thinking about what does it mean to be a part of the family of God? That's, that's, that, that. you know, because here on earth, people like to be, you know, be associated with big names, right? <laughs> right? Folks can marry into certain family, they, you know. They know there's some money there, there's some power, there's some influence. But brothers and sisters, no human family compares to the family of God. Amen. And every human being is invited to be a part of the family of God. In fact, they are a part of the family of God by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The question is whether or not they will accept it. Our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is from uh, Desire of Ages. Uh, to the death of Christ we owe even this earthly life. Never one saint or sinner eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the, by the body and blood of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf, is reflected in every water spring. So he is the savior of the world. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That doesn't mean just Adventists, doesn't mean just Christians. That means all humanity. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Okay. Central concept that the sanctuary reveals of God. Here is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. All right, I'm going to skip over unleavened bread. I talked a little bit about that because I want to at least get to the last, uh, the rest of the festivals. Just want to emphasize in the highest sense, the work of education, the work of redemption are one. The festivals were a means of educating Israel. Year after year after year it was God's, God's intention that they would go through this round of services. And it would help them to understand salvation. So, after Passover, unleavened bread began. And then, the third day, first fruits. This is the day that Christ was resurrected. We know Christ fulfilled it. When you be coming to the land which I give you, and you shall reap the harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. Um, to the heart that has become purified, all is changed. Transformation of character is the testimony to the world of an indwelling Christ. The Spirit of God produces a new life in the soul, bringing the thoughts and desires into obedience to the will of Christ, and the inward man is renewed in the image of God. Weak and erring men and women show to the world that the redeeming power of grace can cause the faulty character to develop into symmetry and abundant fruitfulness. So it is with the true child of God, the religion of Christ reveals itself as a vitalizing, life-giving, pervading principle, a living, working, spiritual energy. Okay, still talking about first fruits, also called the Feast of Wave Sheep. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. And Paul speaks of Christ, Romans, uh, not Romans, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And you remember when he rose, he also, when he ascended, he took 
a train of captives with him to present them as part of the offering of the first fruits. He is the first fruits, but he presented them. You remember at his crucifixion, it tells us in the Bible, at the time of his crucifixion, that there was an earthquake and the tombs were open. Some tombs were open. And it says, and after his resurrection, these people came out and presented themselves to people in the cities. Anybody remember this? Okay. So Christ, the first fruits. And then we go down seven weeks later to the Feast of Pentecost, also called the Feast of Weeks. And the Feast of Weeks, the Pentecost, was the commemoration of the giving of the law. And now this is important because I love my Pentecostal brethren. But I, whenever I see them, I listen and I tell them, I say, you know, so you guys have it kind of half right because God never gives the law without giving his spirit, right? Or he never gives his spirit without giving his law, that's what I should say. And so everybody agrees that the spirit was poured out on, on Pentecost. But it was for the purposes of the covenant. Where God said, well, I will write my law in your, in your hearts and put my spirit within you. And so the early church was anointed to go and to be heralds of the gospel, which is about the spirit and about the law, this interaction that happens through the Holy Spirit on the basis of the power of what Christ has accomplished. So on that day, we're told by Ellen White, that Christ was inaugurated as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Acts chapter 2. And that makes, that makes perfect sense. Because the way a priest was inaugurated or anointed, the oil, representing the Holy Spirit, was poured over his body. So Christ, as the Holy Spirit, the gift given to Christ for the church, his body on earth, was anointed, which was the church on earth. Okay. And out of respect for our speaker who's going to come, I'm really going to rush to this and kind of wrap this up. Okay, Christ's inauguration as high priest, the pilgrimage festivals again, Passover, Feast of Weeks of Pentecost, Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. That includes all of us. First one of many brothers and sisters. All right, so let me just go through those first four again. Passover, and then we come to unleavened bread. The third day, feast of wave sheep, our first fruits when Christ rose from the dead, and then several weeks later we come to Pentecost. Those are the spring festivals. Now, the says in Desire of Ages, not Desire of Ages, Great Controversy, that as the spring festivals were fulfilled in connection with Christ's first coming, the fall festivals are fulfilled in connection with the second coming. Okay? So the Feast of Trumpets. Let me go ahead. The Day of Atonement. The antitype for the Day of Atonement began in what year? 1844. Exactly. So, about 10 years before that, and was actually toward the end of 1843, William Miller received a license as a preacher. And during those years leading up to 1844, he'd already been studying the message. He and others were sounding the trumpet. They were actually fulfilling. They were the antitype of the Feast of Trumpets. They didn't know it because they thought... They thought it was, you know, the, the, the coming of the Lord they were heralding. But it was actually the judgment hour that was coming. And we should also note, I'll say this quickly, that there were many others. Uh, I would suggest, if, if you want to go read something that will really inspire you, go to your computer and put in Rabbi Joseph Wolf. This man preached the Advent message in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, in Israel, in the 1830s uh, and into the 40s, 
This was a Jewish rabbi who I think was born in Bavaria, and he came to know Christ. And he began to go around the world. Ellen White refers to him in great controversy, but I wanted to get more information. And what it shows is how serious God is about getting the message out to people. Okay, oh, feast and trumpets, amen. Okay, and then we're in the Day of Atonement now, right? The Yom Kippur, the antitypical Day of Atonement. And we focus a lot on the investigative judgment. But I must remember, there's an other side of it. We think, when we think about facing judgment, we think about the fact that we have the best lawyer in the universe who is also the judge and who will prepare us and you know so for the believer this is it's not something to be feared the only thing that our anxiety will be we don't want to bring dishonor to him Amen. is there anything I haven't you know confessed he knows but the confession is for us Okay, uh, can I have five more minutes? I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, because I don't want to go with oh, hope so on. Okay, the last of the festivals, the Feast of Trumpets, is stated by Ellen White. She says, it would be well for the people of God at this present time to have a Feast of Tabernacles. I think I said Feast of Trumpets, a Feast of Tabernacles. And of course, the Feast of Tabernacles look back to Israel's dwelling in the wilderness, but it also looks forward to the time when the tabernacle of God will be with God, we will be with him, we will be his people, because the Lord has been, he's really been our dwelling place, right, in all generations, amen? amen. And that was the time of the, uh, the fruit harvest. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering. And remember those last three angels in Revelation 14, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Okay, Christ, the Lion, and the Lamb. And then finally, just about, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Beloved, now we the sons and daughters of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. I'm going to end it right there. Yeah, it's close enough to the end anyway. So I hope this will, if nothing else, kind of whet your appetite if you haven't spent any time uh, looking at those festivals and asking that question, why did God give them? And I think it's for us to realize that salvation is in Christ. And he fulfills those festivals through time. And every one of those represents something that should happen in our own experience. You know how Paul says, if you be risen with Christ, that's the resurrection. Then seek those things with our, which are above. We think about unleavened bread. Paul writes in Colossians about the need to put away things, the purity of life, uh, and of course the tabernacle, uh, to make God our dwelling place to abide in him and let him abide in us. Uh, so there's just a lot of riches there. I want to encourage you uh, uh, just to study it. Just to study it. So God bless you. I really appreciate having the time with you. Let's pray. Love you, Father God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this assembly of your children, your saints. who come together to study your word and the gospel, the righteousness of Christ. Lord, I pray you continue to bless this church. And each and every person who is here today, whether they remember or not, oh God, use each one of us to show the love of Christ, Lord. Just let us become even more immersed and rooted and grounded in you, that the fruits of your righteousness may be seen in our life. Bless each family that is here, every person according to their needs, Father. There may be some that are facing health challenges. We know that you are a healer, whatever the situation, Father. If it's a need for reconciliation with others, we know that you are the one who reconciled the world to yourself. And so we just put ourselves in your hands and we say, have your own way, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.